Last time we saw a number of examples of characteristic functions of probability measures on the real line. The sinc function, sine c over c, was the Fourier transform of the uniform probability measure on the symmetric unit interval. The Cauchy function, 1 over 1 plus c squared, is the Fourier transform of the bilateral exponential distribution of rate 1. The Gaussian density, e to the minus c squared over 2, is the Fourier transform of itself up to scale, the standard normal distribution. And the Humble cosine function is the characteristic function of the Rademacher distribution. All of these are continuous functions, in fact uniformly continuous, as is true of all characteristic functions. In fact, all of these are C infinity, owing to the fact that the distributions that they are characteristic functions of all have finite moments of all orders. But there is one difference apparent in these pictures. The first three are all C0. That is, they decay to zero as the variable C goes to infinity. On the other hand, the cosine function does not satisfy that condition. This is owing to a difference between the underlying distributions. The first three are all transforms of absolutely continuous measures. These three have densities with respect to the Lebesgue measure. This one does not. And in fact, that is a theorem. Although it goes under the name of a lemma, the riemann lebesgue lemma. If mu is a probability measure on Rd that has a density with respect to Lebesgue measure, then we usually denote the Fourier transform of the measure simply as the Fourier transform of the density function. In other words, the Fourier transform of that density function is this integral. And the riemann lebesgue lemma says that if rho is a probability density, an L1 function that is positive, although that's actually not necessary for this theorem, then its Fourier transform defined here is actually a continuous decaying function that goes to zero, as the variable tends to infinity in any direction. Let's prove this now. We're going to do it in three steps. First, we'll prove it when the density is assumed to be a very smooth function, C infinity with compact support. In that case, we can do the same calculation we did in the last lecture when discussing smoothness of characteristic functions, and note that the derivatives with respect to the integration variable x of the Fourier multiplier e x e are i x e j times that multiplier. Of course, i x e j is just a constant, which we can therefore pull outside the integral. But inside the integral, we can now do integration by parts. Since we've assumed that the density rho is smooth and compactly supported, here we simply have a product of two smooth functions, the integral is over the compact support of this function, and so we're in the territory of Riemann. And therefore, we do regular old integration by parts. The boundary terms are zero because we're evaluating at infinity, and there the function rho is zero, and what we get is this expression. Now we can use this equivalent quantity to here to bound the left-hand side, with the triangle inequality for integrals. And that simply gives us this because this quantity has unit complex modulus. Now, we don't know exactly what that is, but we do know that the function rho, under our assumption in this part, is smooth and compactly supported, and therefore its derivatives, also smooth and compactly supported, are L1. That means that this integral is some finite constant mj. But that means, putting all of those together, that the Euclidean length of the vector xi times the modulus of rho of xi is less than or equal to the Euclidean length of the vector whose components are the mj's. And if we call that m, which is a finite constant, that tells us that the characteristic function rho hat of xi is less than or equal to that constant over the Euclidean length of the vector xi, which certainly goes to zero as the length of xi goes to infinity. So not only do we have decay, we have decay at at least a reciprocal linear rate. Now, that's in the case where the density is assumed to be smooth and compactly supported. 
In general, this decay rate will not hold, but the decay itself is universal, as we'll now show in step two. The basic idea here is to now take any L1 density, rho, and approximate it by smooth, compactly supported functions. This kind of approximation is the bread and butter of a graduate real analysis class, and one direct way to do it is to take our general density, rho, and convolve it with a nice bump function, an approximate identity, which will make it smooth and compactly supported if we also do a cutoff. We're going to take a slightly different approach here that is less computational and uses the probabilistic tools we've developed. We will use a Dinkin multiplicative systems theorem approach. So first we will do two cutoffs. We'll take our density function rho and cut it off when it reaches height m for some finite m. Well, we know that this height cutoff of rho converges to rho in L1 as m goes to infinity by the dominated convergence theorem using rho as the dominating function. We could also use the monotone convergence theorem since these are increasing. So what that means is that since we're hoping to approximate rho by smooth compactly supported functions in L1 sense, it's good enough to approximate this by those. So we may assume that rho is bounded. We will also assume that rho is compactly supported because we can also do a cutoff in the domain. If we multiply by the indicator of a ball of radius r, then as r goes to infinity, this domain cutoff also converges to rho in L1, again by the dominated convergence theorem. And so we will henceforth assume that rho is bounded and compactly supported. So we need to now approximate any bounded compactly supported L1 density by smooth compactly supported L1 densities. And to do that, we will just say, let H be the space of all bounded functions supported in the ball of radius R for some fixed R, for which there exists a sequence of smooth compactly supported functions supported inside that ball that converge to h in l1 sense. Our goal is to show that our original density rho after doing these cutoffs is one of these h's. And we will accomplish that by showing that all bounded l1 functions supported in the ball of radius r are contained in h. Well, to do that using Dinkin's theorem in the real setting, we must show that the constant function one is in H. I can do that by taking a sequence psi n of smooth compactly supported functions that are equal to one on the ball of radius r minus one over n. Then as n goes to infinity, these smooth compactly supported functions get closer and closer to the constant function one on the ball of radius r which is the domain we're now considering, and by bounded convergence, that pointwise convergence will turn into L1 convergence, and so one will be in this set, H. Along the same lines, we need to show that H is closed under bounded convergence. That is, we wanna show that if Hn is a sequence of functions in H that converges to some function H in such a way that all of the terms in the sequence are bounded by a fixed constant M, we want to show that H, the limit, is back in the subspace capital H. Well, once again, by this uniform bound M on the compact ball of radius R where all the action is going on, we can conclude from the dominated convergence theorem that Hn minus H tends to zero in L1, but Hn is in capital H which means that it is approximated in L1 sense by smooth compactly supported functions. So that means that in particular, we can find some function psi n that is smooth and compactly supported such that the L1 norm of the difference between Hn and psi n is say less than or equal to one over n. But that means putting these two things together that the L1 difference between H and Psi N is 
less than or equal to the L1 distance from H to Hn plus the L1 distance from Hn to Psi n. And since both of those go to zero, we see that H is approximated by this sequence Psi n over here, and therefore H is back in capital H, proving that this subspace capital H is closed under bounded convergence. Now let's take M to be the space CC infinity, compactly supported smooth functions. Those are all in H because H consists of those functions that are bounded on a fixed ball and these functions are bounded everywhere. It's also a multiplicative system. The product of two smooth compactly supported functions is a smooth compactly supported function. Therefore, we can conclude by Dinkin's multiplicative systems theorem that the space of all bounded functions on the ball of radius r, measurable with respect to the minimal sigma field generated by this class m, is contained in h. But the sigma field generated by m, as we've seen before, particularly in the one-dimensional case, is the full Borel sigma field in this restricted setting. We could, in general, for example, see that by taking the functions e c, which as we saw alone generate the full Borel sigma field, even if we only allow c's to have length one over k for all positive integers k. And just to make things kosher so that those functions are in c c infinity, we can mollify them by multiplying them by some fixed bump function supported in the ball of radius r, which will not change any of the arguments that show that these functions generate the full Borel sigma field. And so there is a probabilistic argument that CC infinity is dense in L1. Great. So now we put these two together. Our goal, proving the riemann lebesgue lemma, is to show that the Fourier transform of our L1 function is in C0. It tends to zero as the variable goes to infinity in length. We already know it's continuous. All characteristic functions are continuous. To do that, we first approximate our density rho by a smooth compactly supported function. So we choose such a psi that is distance no more than epsilon over two in L1 norm away from rho where epsilon is fixed from the beginning. And then we simply note that for any xi, the difference between the Fourier transform of rho and the Fourier transform of this approximating smooth compactly supported function psi at xi is the integral of the difference between rho and xi times the Fourier multiplier. By the triangle inequality for integrals, that's less than or equal to the L1 norm of the difference between rho and xi, again, because this function has unit modulus. And that, by design, is less than epsilon over two. But we showed in the first step of this proof that the Fourier transform of xi goes to zero at infinity. In fact, it goes at rate one over xi. So that means that we can choose some r depending on this approximating function xi, such that outside the ball of radius r, the Fourier transform psi hat is less than epsilon over two. And therefore, on the complement of that same ball, we can break up rho hat as rho hat minus psi hat plus psi hat, and using the triangle inequality for complex numbers, by construction that is less than epsilon. That is, for every epsilon, we can choose an r so that outside the ball of radius r, rho hat is less than epsilon, which is exactly to say that rho hat of xi tends to zero as the length of xi tends to infinity concluding the proof of the Riemann-Lebesgue lemma.